In today's video, I'm going to be breaking down how to turn this live action footage into a stylized animation using rotoscoping in Adobe Animate. Let's begin. Hello everyone, my name is Elliot, also known as Eliano over on Instagram. I'm a self-trained motion designer and I've been making these animated goal clips for a couple years now, which have been seen millions of times over on the Sporf Instagram and Twitter accounts, and I've been asked for years how exactly I create them. So after finally finding some free time, I decided to break down my process. The technique we'll be applying is called rotoscoping. The definition of rotoscoping is tracing over live action footage frame by frame in order to recreate that footage into an animated setting. It's a technique used since the beginning of animation, even used in classic Walt Disney films. To take part in this tutorial, you will need an Adobe Creative Cloud account with Adobe Animate, Adobe Premiere and Adobe Media Encoder downloaded. Step 1. Editing your footage. To start things off, you'll need to open up Adobe Premiere. From here, you'll need to create a new project by clicking the New Project button. Give the project a suitable name, I'm going to call it Mbappe Edit, and I'll give the project file the same name. Click OK at the bottom of the window, and now you have opened a Adobe Premiere project file. Now with that being set up, you will need to bring in your footage. You can do this by clicking File and Import, and then select the footage that you want to animate. And then click the Import button, and the video will be brought into your project window. Then double click on the video to preview it in this tab on the left of the screen called the source monitor. The source monitor just gives you the ability to preview your footage without having to drag it into a timeline. When it appears in the source monitor, you'll need to scroll across to find the section of the video you want to animate. To play the clip in the source monitor, you can click L, to pause you can click K, and to rewind you can click J. Double tap J and L to rewind and fast forward respectively. You can also see each individual frame of the video by using the left and right arrow keys. Once you've found the section that you want to edit, you'll need to mark the beginning and end sections. That way you don't need to drag the whole video into your project timeline. To select the beginning and end points, you can either use these two icons here in the source monitor tab, or you can simply type I and O for marking the in and out sections of the video. Now you need to put the footage into a timeline sequence. To create a sequence, click on this notepad icon at the bottom of the project window and click sequence. Then you'll need to click on the settings tab and make the editing mode custom. Now because I want this video to appear on my Instagram feed, I want it to be a square video, so I'm going to change the size of the video to 1080 pixels, both horizontally and vertically. And I also want to change the frame rate of this video. With the standard frame rate in the UK being 25 frames per second, I'm going to make it 12.5 frames a second. This is done to make the video mimic a more closer look to traditional hand-drawn animation. A trick that animators used to do is draw on twos, also known as drawing on every two frames. That way you only need to draw half the frames you need, that way you're basically halving the amount of time on any project you're working on. And then each frame is just going to get doubled later in editing, making it 25 frames a second. You can obviously change the frame rate to whatever you want, but keep in mind, the more frames that your edited video has, the more drawings you'll end up having to do. Once that has been selected, give your sequence a name and click OK. Now you have a timeline where you can drag your clip into. Drag the video clip icon in the source monitor to drag the video into the timeline and make sure you click keep existing settings if this little window appears. Now the video clip is a little off center, so I'm gonna do some very minimal editing just to change the position of the video as it goes along. To do this, you can double click on the video in the timeline and then click on the effects control tab on the left of the screen. Click on the stopwatch to create a keyframe and reposition the video accordingly using these two numbers which represent the horizontal and vertical position of the video. Keep adding keyframes by moving these two numbers and make sure the video stays in place. Now the video is done, we're ready to export it. To export the video, click on the file tab and then click export and then click media. Now when this render window appears, the format is set to H.264 as this will make it easier to import the video into Adobe Animate. Make sure you also click on the file name and save the video in the correct folder and has the correct name that you want it to. Then just click export and once the video has rendered, you'll now have your footage ready for Adobe Animate. Step 2. Import your footage into Adobe Animate. Now you will need to open up Adobe Animate and when you see this opening menu, you simply need to click the create new button. From here you'll be given a document settings menu. You'll need to make sure your Adobe Animate document matches the settings of your reference video. In this case, make it 1080 by 1080 with a frame rate of 12 and a half frames per second and make sure it's set to an action script 3.0 before clicking create. This will open up your timeline where you'll see a blank white square in the middle of the screen. This section is known as the stage and it is where your animation will be displayed and edited. 
Below this, you'll see a series of rectangles. This is your timeline. Similarly to Adobe Premiere, however, you can see each individual frame represented by each rectangle. Now, at the moment, there's nothing to preview. We just see this white square because we need to import our footage. To do this, go to File, click Import, and then click Import Video. From here, you'll see this pop-up menu appear, and you'll need to click the Embed H.264 video into Timeline. This way, your footage will be imported as one video file, as we already previously exported the video as a H.264 video file. Then all you need to do is click Browse, select your edited reference footage, and then click Open. From here, you simply need to click the Next button. On this next menu slide, make sure you uncheck the Include Audio version, as we will not be importing or editing any audio throughout this tutorial. Then simply click Next, and finally click Finish. And now you'll see your footage inside Adobe Animate. Step 3. Animating your footage. Now your footage appears on the stage and has been imported onto a layer in your timeline. The first thing you'll want to do is label your layer as footage. You can do this by double clicking on the layer's name and then just typing in footage. And then you'll want to lock this layer by clicking this padlock icon in the timeline window. By doing this, you'll be avoiding any drawings appearing on your reference footage, which when exported will actually appear throughout the entirety of the video. So make sure you put the padlock on this layer. Now we're going to be animating the first section of Kylian Mbappe here on a separate layer. To add a new layer, click this plus icon on the timeline and name it accordingly with the section you'll be animating. In this case, I'll be labelling it shirt. You'll be doing this process for every section of the animation. Think of it like a cutout animation in South Park or one of those pancake art videos you might have seen. You basically want there to be a hierarchy to the images you're creating in order to display some level of depth. Otherwise, the whole image will look flat and it will be more difficult to tell what's actually on screen. Keep in mind you're trying to turn live action footage into a cartoon. Now, after you've added a new layer, you'll see that there is a grey rectangle appearing above your footage layer in the timeline. This is the keyframe of that shirt layer. And you'll need to convert this one grey rectangle into several individual rectangles within the timeline. Because, as mentioned before, all of these individual rectangles in your timeline represent each frame. With it being one rectangle, it basically means that you're just having one frame dragged out during the duration in the timeline. By converting this into individual keyframes, we can draw an image on each frame. You can do this by double-clicking on the layer, which will select the whole of the grey rectangle, and then by right-clicking and then selecting Convert to Blank Keyframes. If this isn't done, it will mean that whatever is drawn on one frame will appear throughout the entire animation. And with the drawings in our animation changing each and every frame, we don't want that. But if we convert it to blank keyframes, it means we can draw a new drawing every single frame and therefore create the animated look we are going for. Now we've got that sorted, let's choose our colour for the shirt. If we select the brush tool here in the side panel, or by clicking B, we can use this eyedropper tool to choose the colour from the shirt in our reference footage. This colour that we've selected then will be the colour we'll be using with the brush tool. Make sure your brush settings have a size of 1 and make sure that the zoom size with stage box is also ticked as well. Now if we draw the, with the brush tool selected, it will appear in that frame. To see your drawing without the reference video, you simply need to click this eye icon on the footage layer to hide or reveal the frames on that layer. And to go forwards and backwards on the frames in your timeline, all you need to do is click the comma and full stop buttons on your keyboard. Now we've got that sorted, we're ready to draw around the section that we want to be this colour. In order to do that, you simply have the brush tool selected and just simply trace around the edge of the shirt and make sure that all the lines connect. Once you've done that, you now need to fill that outline with your brush colour. To do that, you can click on the paint bucket tool or click the K button. With the tool selected, head over to this square here in the paint bucket settings and click over the setting Close Large Gaps. If this is selected, it will mean that if there are any large gaps where your outlines don't connect, it will be filled up easier by the paint bucket. If you don't do that, it'll be more difficult to fill up your drawings, as shown here. This will mean you'll have to draw around your outline again, which can be tedious and silly, and we want this to be as quick of a process as possible. Now that you've filled up the outline of the shirt, you've finished that section on that frame. Now all you need to do is repeat the process on all of the frames in your timeline. <laughs> the outlines have been drawn on each frame, make sure to double check if there's any errors such as sections not being filled or if the outlines don't match up. You can click this loop button above your timeline and click the enter key in order to watch your footage on repeat to check if there's any issues with your animation. 
As you can see here, this section of the shirt seems to be waving a little bit too much between these frames. So I'm going to use my brush tool to extend the outline and fill it in just like I've done before. I'm also going to clean up some of the outlines by using the eraser tool, which can be clicked on the side panel or by clicking the E button on your keyboard. Now that those frames have been cleaned up, I'm happy with this section and I'm going to move on to the shorts. With the shorts being beneath the shirt, I'm going to create a new layer below the shirt layer and label it shorts. And for the colour of the shorts, I'm going to make it slightly darker than the one we used on the shirt layer. This is how we can create some extra depth and have all of the sections displayed on screen a little bit more accurately. Once the colour has been chosen, you now repeat the same process for the shorts as you did for the shirt, by drawing an outline and filling in on every frame. the shorts now completed, let's tackle the socks. Once again, make a new layer and place it below the shorts and label it socks. For consistency, I'm going to use the same colour I used for the shirt and repeat the process of once again creating an outline and then filling in. With the socks now being completed, let's move on to the boots by simply choosing our colour and once again repeating the same process of outlining and filling in each frame. Now in order to add just a little bit more detail, I'm going to add these little white parts to the boots in order to create a bit more depth as mentioned before. Same process, add a new layer above the boots and then just draw over each section on every frame. With the colour I just used being a white, I can't actually preview it on our stage. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to change the stage colour. Think of it as just the colour of your background. I'm going to choose a colour that doesn't match any of the colours I'm planning on using in my animation. So I'm going to choose a green, and as you can see, the white comes through perfectly. Now before we get onto the skin and hair, I'm going to add a little bit more detail to the shirt. I'm a very big fan of this stripe that appears on the PSG kit as it's part of the logo and part of the club branding, so, so I want to include it on the shirt. In order to do that, I'm going to basically create two layers, one white layer and one red layer. And I'm simply going to draw each of the layers in the same way individually and place them over the shirt and make sure these lines don't cross over at the top or the bottom of the shirt just by going through every frame after I've completed outlining and filling in and just using the eraser tool to neaten stuff up and sometimes touching up a little bit with the brush tool until it looks appropriate. to the final section which is the skin and the hair. I'm going to draw an outline around the head on a brand new layer and apply the skin tone to it going through each and every frame. I'm then going to repeat the process with the hair by placing a new layer behind the head and continuing to outline and fill in accordingly on every frame. I'm then going to create a separate skin layer that goes underneath everything where I'll be able to draw the hands and the knees in the same skin tone. Now for the neck, I'm going to apply another layer and it's going to be below all of the clothes layers and also below the head layer. The reason why I'm doing this is again, creating that level of depth. One of the more common problems I see with most people trying this style of rotoscoping is that the head shape doesn't look realistic. The chin ends up blending into the neck because they've used the same color. Whilst if you do this process where you create a new layer and similarly to how we applied the shorts color by making it a darker version of the shirt color, you can create that little bit more depth and it makes the head stand out a lot more. And you'll also notice there is this white section on one of the sleeves on the shirt right here. This is again is just a minor detail that you don't have to add. You don't have to add any of the extra details, but I just think it pops a little bit and makes the hand a bit more clearer to see. I'm also going to apply a different colour to the hands on these frames here because as you can see the hands go over the face and again because they go over the face it will just create a weird looking blob that doesn't really represent the footage that well. And now with all the frames featuring all of the sections outlined and filled in you have now completed your rotoscope animation. Now the last thing we need to do is change the colour of the stage which will therefore change our background colour in our animation. I'm going to be choosing this shade of blue, it's a little bit lighter than the kit colour and I'm using blue because it's a prominent colour associated with PSG, so therefore aesthetically it matches up quite well. Now that we've done that, we're ready to now export our rotoscope animation. 
All you then need to do is go to File, click Export, and then click Export Video slash Media. And from here, you're going to get this Export Media window appearing. Now you have a choice here of either ignoring the stage colour, which will create a transparent background when your video is rendered, or you can choose to keep the stage colour and therefore the video will be exported as one full video. I sometimes ignore the stage colour if I'm going to be adding any background elements, maybe such as some smoke or any other effects that are going to appear in and around the animations itself. But for this one, because we're keeping it simple, we're going to include the stage colour as our background layer. Now I typically tend to have my export preset as a QuickTime file and then as a GoPro Cineform RGB file. Then by clicking this little output folder, you can choose where you want your footage to be exported. And from there, you've exported your rotoscope animation. Now it's ready for any last minute edits that we want to do back in Premiere. Step four, finalizing your footage. Now to complete the look of my videos, I tend to add this little film grain effect over the top of my footage. Now this is completely optional, you don't need to use this, I just think it adds a little bit of a rustic feel to my videos. In order to do this, I import my rotoscope footage into a new sequence, and then I simply lay the film grain on a layer above my rotoscope footage. Then I simply trim it to match the length of my rotoscope footage, and then make sure I set the blend mode to multiply. And as you can see by doing that, the white part of the video disappears, leaving only the film grain over my footage. And then just give a little once over my footage to make sure there's no errors at this point and then simply export as a h.264 file and now my rotoscope has been completed thank you so much for watching this video if you enjoyed it please leave a like and make sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell as i'm hoping to add more tutorials in the coming weeks and months i had a lot of fun doing this and it exploring the process of how I actually create these rotoscope animations and I'd love to do more on the other types of videos that I've created on my Instagram page which you should also go and follow and if you see anything on there that you'd like to learn let me know by leaving a comment either on my Instagram or on this YouTube video and I'll maybe make a tutorial on it. Thank you so much for watching, cheers!